Good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, good evening uh, from wherever you're joining us uh, across the world. This is uh, Filippo Veglio with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, team um, connecting from uh, Geneva. A very warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you on behalf of the team to this uh, virtual event WCC is organizing today, uh, the second uh, of um, these sessions today focused on key trends and disruptions uh, for the decade uh, ahead. I hope you're all uh, healthy and safe uh, in the midst, uh, of course, of, of this crisis. And um, we hope that not only you are safe, but also, of course, your loved ones, uh, your colleagues, your uh, partners uh, from all across uh, the world. Uh, today's session, as I mentioned, is uh, focused on the key trends and disruptions uh, for the period 2020 to 2030. We will be having uh, insights uh, from a number of uh, speakers uh, whom I will present in a little while. Uh, just to highlight the host today is myself, uh, Filippo, uh, Managing Director of the People Program and of the Outreach Functions in uh, WBCSD. And it's my pleasure to walk you through the agenda and facilitate the discussions alongside the uh, speakers uh, this afternoon uh, here Geneva time. Uh, today's uh, session is part of a series of uh, virtual events that we are uh, running uh, across uh, the four months of April, May, June and uh, July of this year uh, in response, of course, to the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic and, and uh, the impossibility of organizing our traditional, first and foremost, our traditional delegates meeting in Montreal in Switzerland uh, in uh, the end of April, but also the impossibility of organizing other uh, sessions. Uh, we uh, highlight through this virtual event series two sessions per week as sort of um, uh, featured uh, sessions taking place each Monday and Wednesday of uh, the coming uh, several weeks. Uh, we have alongside those sessions a number of working group and sort of deeper dive sessions uh, led by individual program and project uh, teams across the WBCSD structure from all over uh, the world. And we hope that these sessions can provide uh, you in the attendees uh, with uh, you know, interesting uh, facts, trends, uh, insights, expertise, but hopefully also uh, inspiration around what the WBCST community is working on in terms of what it is uh, sharing. And we, of course, look forward to any sort of feedback uh, all along uh, the way. And allow me to point you to the website that you see outlined uh, here. Uh, to get additional information is a freely accessible web uh, platform that gives you the full schedule and, of course, also the full information on past events, including recordings and uh, slides. In my position as host is also my duty um, to um, highlight a number of uh, sort of housekeeping uh, issues, as we call them in WBCSD. First uh, of all, the uh, information for all of you that the session is being uh, recorded. Uh, that uh, all of you in the participants list are uh, muted and a kind request for all of you except for our speakers today uh, to please switch the video function uh, off. Uh, we all know that bandwidth is, uh, you know, it should be all right uh, via Zoom, but you never know. And, and I think the, the less chances we take on that, the better. So if you could please take the video function off for bandwidth uh, purposes and for bandwidth purposes only. Thank you so much for that. Also to highlight that the slides that we are presenting today and the recording will be made available in the coming 24 uh, hours. We will consolidate the earlier session of today and, and this afternoon session uh, for you all who have uh, registered and it will also be made available on the uh, WBCST events uh, website. Uh, last but not least, the idea that the, we would like to have, of course, uh, your uh, questions, your comments, your thoughts, and for that, uh, it's probably easiest to use the chat uh, function. So please um, pay attention to the chat function. Um, feel free to, to use it. And we will be uh, channeling the questions and I'll be looking at those uh, in the course of the next uh, hour or a little bit more than an hour that we have to go through this particular session on trends and disruptions. So thank you for taking note of those housekeeping items. And thank you also for taking note of this particular housekeeping item, which concerns uh, all of uh, WBCSD's meetings with regard to antitrust uh, issues. The reminder that we have on this slide is to kindly invite you to take note uh, that any discussion and any conversation should refrain from addressing competitively uh, sensitive 
uh, topics such as the ones outlined here, from pricing and cost issues to bid strategies to future capacity additions or reductions to customer discussions through any uh, output uh, decision. Thank you so much for considering this uh, given uh, the nature of uh, the organization and this meeting. We are very grateful that you uh, take note also of this particular uh, issue. So today's agenda around these trends and disruptions, we have articulated it around uh, three uh, pillars. I'll give you a very short overview around WBCSD and the context of today's uh, session, uh, given that the sessions are open uh, not only to members and partners of WBCSD, but also to outside uh, stakeholders. Uh, just a brief overview from my end for about three or four uh, minutes and then I'll be handing over to our speakers of today, uh, four of them to be precise, who will dive into these uh, trends and disruptions and in particular we will have uh, research insights from my colleague Julian hill -Lando, and we'll have three member companies of WBCST sharing their perspectives, uh, Nestle, Shell and Novo uh, Nordisk. We will then uh, wrap up the session uh, upon completing those perspectives and answering your questions and that will happen at the latest uh, 80 or so minutes uh, from uh, now. So this is the overall agenda that we have laid out uh, for all of you who are kindly uh, joining us uh, now. Allow me very briefly uh, to go into an overview of WBCSD. WBCSD, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, a difficult acronym always to spell out, but the idea of an association regrouping at 200 uh, companies from about 20 industry sectors and 40 countries across the world looking at headquarter location and, and looking at linking the sustainability agenda to business success. Uh, led by the belief that there is a space, there is an opportunity for business leadership to drive the transition to a more sustainable uh, world. And the articulation of that sustainable world is outlined as you can see on the slide around the world in which by mid-century we have nine plus billion people who are living well and within the uh, boundaries of uh, the planet. I very warmly welcome uh, on behalf of the team, uh, our WBCSD members who could make it to this uh, session. As I said, 200 of them all across the world. We are very uh, happy and proud of uh, them to be a part of our uh, network of uh, companies. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time away from your busy schedules uh, to be with us in particular, of course, to the speakers of our uh, member uh, companies who are sharing their insights today with us uh, around these trends and disruptions. Thank you also to the partners, the global network partners in particular, but of course also our institutional partners who could take the time uh, to join us uh, today. Again, very briefly, this is not going to be an institutional uh, presentation. This is actually the only slide that uh, presents what is WCST focusing on. In a nutshell, it is looking at six uh, program areas all articulated around the belief or the need of system transformation, major economic systems need to transform and our focus, lie on the, our focus lies on the six areas that you see uh, here, ranging from the circularity agenda to the ur urban infrastructure agenda, the energy and climate uh, issues, food and nature as an important agenda, a rising agenda, uh, people and social impacts, uh, and last but not least, the agenda of what we call redefining value, measuring, valuing, and disclosing uh, the nature of companies' performance when it comes not only to financial capital, but also to natural and uh, social uh, capital to drive this idea of sustainable capitalism forward. So for all those who are interested, you, uh, you are more than welcome to visit our website and find a lot more information on each particular uh, program and the underlying projects uh, underneath uh, them. The context of today's session is uh, what we call in WBCSD uh, Vision 2050. As I outlined uh, before, this idea that 9 billion people live well within the boundaries of the planet uh, by 2050. This is a concept that emerged a decade ago uh, where we had uh, 30 companies articulating the role of business in contributing to a more sustainable uh, future. And we uh, took, uh, we have been taking over a year now uh, to work with the 40 companies outlined uh, here with their logos uh, to refresh uh, this vision. So how do we bring the vision uh, up to date? How do we make it relevant to today's uh, context? How do we apply a, a critical lens to the results we have come up with a decade ago? And how do we look ahead in particular uh, to the decade uh, coming up, 2020 to 2030, with a fresh pair 
of eyes and fresh pair of expertise, of scientific insights, of member uh, expertise and um, ideas and thoughts and innovations. So how do we really outline, as we put it here, the routes to what is an achievable and sustainable future that companies are excited and energized to rally around and to work uh, towards. And importantly, of course, when we say 2030 is oftentimes linked, of course, to the Sustainable Development uh, Goals Agenda, the Agenda 2030. How do we make these SDGs directly uh, actionable for business? How can this piece of work contribute to making them more actionable for business uh, using this system uh, transformation uh, approach? Within the work of Vision 2050, it's basically divided in five uh, parts and the, and the 40 companies and the, the project team and our experts are working uh, on these five issues outlined here. Uh, firstly, the uh, concept of system transformation. How do we contribute uh, to making this uh, concept uh, more understandable? How do we contribute insights and, and thinking and a narrative around it? How do we also look at the pathways between today and 2050 in terms of where uh, the overall objectives lie, where we want to go and what business uh, can do and has to do to get us uh, there along that path? How do we look, as I mentioned before, in particular at the um, decade ahead, so this operating environment of the decade ahead, uh, what is it that companies need to navigate in terms of topic and issues that they had on the radar and what are some additional potential disruptions that could come into play. And uh, what better example, of course, uh, uh, tragically, of course, as well than COVID-19 in that particular context, we will be addressing that as well in the course of this uh, session. Then uh, on the fourth pillar side, you've got what we call the barriers and the enablers to the system transformation, to the systemic uh, transformation. Uh, what is the latest thinking around how things get done at scale? How can uh, progress be accelerated? at scale. And also lastly, uh, how are different regions of the world, different sectors, different uh, perspectives across the world coming into play as we develop this global vision for a sustainable world with a clear role and opportunity and the, and the responsibility also for business uh, to shape it. So how do we gather inputs from all across the world, from hundreds of companies over and beyond the 40 that are actively shaping the strategic piece? How do we gather these inputs and how do we uh, stress test or how do we test some of the concepts and the findings. So a comprehensive program taking place across 18 months. Uh, the objective of the team and the members is to complete this piece by the end of this year. And this is part and parcel of uh, one of the key pillars here, as you see outlined, the third work stream in terms of the operating uh, environment. So with that, I have hopefully given you not too long an introduction and context to the, to the pieces that we are going to be addressing uh, now over the next uh, hour or so, the trends and disruptions 2020, 2030, uh, where we will kick off uh, with our uh, speakers. Our speakers, you see them outlined here on this uh, image. We will first and foremost have uh, Julian Hill Landold, uh, my colleague, uh, also dialing in from Geneva, who is our uh, director for the Vision 2050 uh, refresh uh, project, as we call it. He will share the perspectives of what we have come up so far in terms of the insights uh, of this particular piece, working with members and, and experts along the way. And then we will ask three of our member company representatives to provide comments on what they have heard and to provide their reflections on how they look at this kind of strategic thinking uh, from their own view and of within their own company's uh, perspective. And for that, I very warmly welcome uh, Duncan Pollard, uh, Anne uh, Gadegard and uh, Dr. Cho On Kong uh, from uh, Shell, Novo Nordisk and uh, Nestle to this call. And thank you so much um, for taking uh, your time and uh, for sharing your thoughts later on uh, this afternoon, uh, Geneva uh, time. So uh, with that said, I would like to hand it over to Julian Hill Landold, uh, my colleague. Julian, I think your audio works. I will be clicking through the slides and uh, basically pass over to you to uh, lead us through these trends and disruptions. Julian. Thanks very much, Felipe. You can go back to the, the slide you'd already gone forward to. Great. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Over to you. So, uh, let me uh, just give a little bit of context about the, where this looking forward piece sits within um, the original Vision 2050 and also within our new piece first. So I hope many of you on the call are aware of the, the original Vision 2050 publication and this pathway that you see here, the, the 
the way that we chose to depict the must-have transitions that needed to take place during uh, a time period which we called the turbulent teens uh, in order for systemic change to successfully take place during the subsequent transformation time, which was the period that we envisaged from 2020 to 2050. Um, if you go forward to slide, Filippo, what's actually slightly less well known about the, the original Vision 2050 work is they also did spend quite a bit of time identifying the kinds of risks uh, and wild cards that were seen as potential barriers to progress to the achievement of the vision of 9 billion people living well within planetary boundaries. And while many of the, the risks that they identified 10 years ago did indeed materialize to one degree or another over the last 10 years, societal mitigation, or was, as was rightly brought up this morning, adaptation strategies did, didn't really appear to the same degree. Neither government, business, nor society took these threats as seriously as they needed to, and as a consequence, making progress against both our vision uh, and uh, sustainable development challenges in general has been made harder. If you go to the next slide, Philippe, I thought I'd draw on the comments made by one of our executive committee uh, members from Shell, Harry Breckelmans, who said, I know you often refer to the predictive qualities of the previous Vision 2050 effort in the context of the turbulent teens, and would also say that I expect fully to see turbulent 20s and likely turbulent 30s too. So let's start visioning these in more detail. And so from the word go on this project, that statement was made back in sort of April of last year, I think. We knew that we wanted to uh, look and think about what the next 10 years might throw a business in, in, in great detail, not just in terms of sustainability challenges, but we also wanted to explore more generally what the world would look like and consider how that would affect businesses ability to operate successfully so that it can also operate more sustainably in effect we wanted to not just identify the kinds of risks and wildcards that might uh, appear an impact but also think about what we would do about them rather than just assuming that someone would figure it out for us which i think is a little bit what happened last time around if you go to the next slide Filippo. So the question was really how to generate a picture of the future that business could use to properly plan the way in which it would react to events that could both prevent as well as assist progress towards Vision 2050 over the next 10 years. Although we would have loved to have spent more time exploring scenarios, for instance, or reflexive futures in support of this picture, in the end we settled on uh, a relatively straightforward method of investigation. The first thing that we did was to step back from sustainability and to look at a number of different landscapes that affect businesses' ability to operate in general. So that's anything from politics to economics to society, technology, environment, regulations. Uh, what the trends in these landscapes might be that we can see today that was so well established that we would likely see them continue or deepen over the next 10 years. So those were in effect how we would develop our highly ma likely macro trends. Secondly, we looked at the trends that we could see developing that had weaker signals that were slightly less likely to impact, but that were nonetheless completely plausible. And if they did occur, that would cause significant impact. So those were our, that was our way of out, uh, identifying disruptions. And finally, of course, we would need to think about how these would impact our Vision 2050 pathways both in terms of intensifying or alleviating the challenges themselves, as well as our ability to make progress towards our vision of nine plus billion people living well within planetary boundaries. So if you go forward a slide. So we started by interviewing a number of members within the Vision 2050 project. We got access to a fantastic range of different roles from one company's chief economist to another's human and cultural futures director. Uh, we also partnered with Volans and together we built on these interviews uh, and on our own desk-based research to help create a long research document covering these different landscapes in depth. In the end we actually moved away slightly from what you may have recognised as a personal analysis uh, and instead organised our landscapes by demographics, environment, economics, technology, politics and culture. Uh, and that uh, has all been gathered in a long research document which will be made available uh, I think early next week 
Um, we've also produced a shorter summary of this uh, long research document, which is what we uh, use to draw out the macro trends and disruptions that we believe business should prepare for and what we'll be talking through uh, today. Although I should note right now that there simply isn't time to do both the macro trends and the disruptions. So I'm going to be looking at the disruptions this afternoon. We cover the macro trends this morning. And if you want to learn about both in detail, then just uh, listen to the recording that you'll be receiving uh, tomorrow along with the materials. It's also important to note, as you listen to what I've got to say today, that we're not trying to put a particular spin, positive or negative, on the analysis that we've come up with. The, the point is to take a clear-eyed view of what the 2020s might have in store so that we can develop more effective strategies for how to respond and make progress on our vision 2050. We will need strategies that harness the momentum created by trends that can act as tailwinds, just as we'll need strategies that are resilient and adaptive in the face of inevitable headwinds. So Filippo just click forward and you can go forward again now. So of course the rhino in the room is COVID-19. Like most of other forecasts of recent years, we had identified pandemic as something that would, uh, that the world would be ill-equipped to deal with were it to occur, not to mention something that was actually quite likely to occur. And yet we too find ourselves pretty much stunned by the arrival of the COVID-19 global public health crisis in the first few weeks of the decade. It's powerfully just demonstrating profound, wide-ranging, and more often than not, long-lasting consequences that such disruptions can have. It's triggered multiple disruptive shocks and accelerated many of the macro trends that we've identified. So we did ask ourselves whether we could actually still release the summary as it is. Um, and despite the ongoing public health crisis and what looks likely to be the deepest economic contraction for the centuries, we decided that these macro trends and disruptions remain valid. They've not suddenly gone away. They're structurally, they're still there. Um, so COVID-19 may serve to accelerate or intensify these macro trends and, and, and also some of the disruptions, but it's essential that we consider them at the same time as planning the response and eventual recovery from the current crisis. Just so you know, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen there uh, uh, an advert for a, a subsequent session on Wednesday of this week on COVID-19. We are uh, issuing a separate issue brief that will look at COVID-19 um, in greater depth at the impl implications of the pandemic, both in terms of the trends and the disruptions laid out in this paper, but also more broadly with regard to the lessons learned from past recoveries and therefore how business can consider responding to this crisis. Um, and so on to the data. So I'll very quickly give an overview of the macro trends before moving in detail onto disruptions. Um, you'll see a picture of a, of a big river. And I just use that as a, as a metaphor because its course is largely set for the next 10 years. If the river is heading where we want to see it heading, we can protect its course. If the river is heading towards riskier uh, land or it seems to be running out of steam, then we can act to protect its flow. And that's really how we should be thinking about the macro trends as well. They are largely baked into what is going to happen. If you go to the next slide, Filippo. Filippo, next slide. Sorry, <laughs> wonderful. Um, uh, here you'll see the, the six categories I described, demographics, environment, economy, technology, politics, and culture. And in each, uh, in each category, two macro trends. Uh, and there's also some logic to the, the order in which we did our thinking here, which is that these things move from those which are most certain, for instance, demographics uh, and, and population, those things that are essentially locked in, environmental impacts as well, uh, to those that are more fluid, such as politics and cultural shifts. Um, and so, as I said, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll very quickly uh, list the trends that we identified uh, the macro trends that we identified in these categories. So uh, in demographics, we looked at generational handover. This is the, the balance of power starting to shift away from boomers towards millennials and Gen Z. And we also looked at population growth in Asia and Africa and how it will grow faster there than anywhere else, contributing to the ongoing shift of geoeconomic power. 
Uh, everyone on this call will be keenly aware of the number of planetary boundaries human society is already in breach of. Uh, and if anything, our, uh, the current situation is revealing how our economic, social, political and health systems all have high levels of interdependence on the environment. So, for instance, the increased risk of pandemics arising from a combination of climate change, biodiversity and deforestation. Uh, we also looked in detail at the, the way in which worsening climate impacts would be more frequent, more severe, uh, and therefore harder to ignore, but also how climate would, would be far from the, the only show in town over the next 10 years, uh, and how uh, the, the more local um, uh, forms of environmental uh, challenge, such as pollution, land degradation, uh, and scarcity, would both uh, raise awareness, but also uh, suffering, instability, displacement, and hopefully uh, innovation as a result as well. On the economy, COVID-19 has obviously completely transformed the short-term outlook, but the long-term trajectory was already far from certain. Structural weaknesses were very high at the start of the year. Uh, for instance, underinvestment, high debt and inequality, slow productivity growth, stranded asset risks, all these things were already underlying uh, within the system and therefore a swift recovery from the, the, the impact of the COVID-19 shock seems highly unlikely. Um, we also looked in, uh, in the macro trends section of the economy at the, the peak of globalization and the rise of Asia. Uh, this is the this is the um, the decade in which the long talked about economic shift to the east will finally happen. Perhaps even earlier than predicted, uh, Asia's share of global GDP will push past 50% uh, and continue to rise. But as a result of that, uh, existing tensions around uh, trade um, and economic uh, power centres will continue to rise. Technology, another one of the trends that has been amplified by the current situation with COVID-19, uh, e-commerce, remote working, online learning, telemedicine, all having a huge boost in the last few weeks for those lucky enough to, to benefit from, from these things. Vaccine research also being turbocharged. Uh, the, the, the role of automation uh, being floated as something that could support uh, our efforts to restrict the, the, the spread of the virus and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the fact is that automation will uh, impact more and more industries, more and more countries, more and more of our lives. It will uh, become a central factor in the next decade uh, that we have to, to deal with more and more. Similarly, datafication for better and worse, we will be more surveilled. Uh, we will have also be smarter, hopefully through the use of this data, uh, we've looked at the, the, the role of technology over the next decade uh, and how companies will have to consider weighing up the, uh, the positive and the negative aspects of what technology makes possible. Uh, politics, uh, I'm just looking at the time, I, I'll, I'll move on a little bit more rapidly, but essentially polarisation and radicalism have been on the rise for some time. High levels of dissatisfaction will uh, continue to create uh, the appetite on both the, 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 the side of um, more populism and nationalism, but it also gives, uh, creates the, the ground required for radical alternatives on the more progressive side of things. And, and we see uh, signals of that uh, again being brought to the fore, uh, the conversation being brought to the foreground far more prominently uh, by people questioning how we respond to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And finally, uh, continuing instability. Sadly, a side effect of the number of uh, populists who have found their way into power of the recent years in recent years is a reduction uh, in the, um, the the functioning of multilateralism uh, and we actually see that again uh, in the way that countries have been responding to the COVID-19 crisis uh, it has been a triumph for nationalism uh, and uh, and less so for multilateralism nonetheless again uh, there are opportunities uh, to latch on to uh, in how we respond to this crisis and we look at those in more detail in, in, the, uh, in the, the report that will be coming out next week.
Finally, culture, very quickly, uh, we see definite signs uh, of attitudes to ownership uh, changing uh, around the world uh, in a range of different countries uh, at a range of different income levels. It's not uh, neatly segmented rich versus poor or urban versus uh, rural, so that's nice. Whereas cultural wars uh, escalating is uh, more neatly segmented uh, in cultural clashes between, for instance, the young and old, or rural and urban, or rich and poor, not necessarily by any specific uh, topic. There are a range of issues on which uh, people are uh, not agreeing anymore, uh, and polarization is sort of fueling uh, people's ability to, uh, to move into ever more separated camps. So that was a whistle stop tour. Uh, of the macro trends that we've looked at. I'm sorry for, for doing it so quickly, but as I say, you can listen to the, the, the full uh, review of it in the recording that you'll get tomorrow. I will, I will say one uh, thing quickly to wrap up on this is that clearly uh, many of these macro trends are interlinked. Uh, and I, as I said, some are very certain, but others are more uh, fluid in terms of how they'll play out. And the role that business and society uh, and individuals can play in the direction that these go in um, is, uh, you know, it becomes more and more important. We had already done uh, some work on thinking about uh, how these interrelations or how these responses might play out before the COVID crisis uh, came about. And I think it's worth just giving you an example of one. So for instance, on the politics of generational handover, you have the millennials and Generation Z, whose formative years have been dominated by fallout from the 2007-8 financial crisis. Uh, and now they're seeing something similar occurring with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic likely hitting Gen Z uh, that avoided the fallout from the financial crisis in the same way or even worse. So they've got two major economic downturns and they've grown up with the awareness that climate chaos uh, is likely to increase in there their lifetimes and less uh, changes to the global economy are implemented. Um, so this context is related in many millennials and Gen Z being quite disenchanted with the status quo, including with capitalism. Um, and though there are exceptions, uh, we do see um, uh, we do see that that uh, that disenchantment being relatively widespread. So while all generations tend to get more conservative with age, there's a good chance that this trend uh, will be uh, less pronounced amongst those currently under 40, precisely because they've been economically squeezed and know that on the current trajectories, they will live out their old age in a world that's where their pension pots aren't as big or where it's severely disrupted by climate change and biodiversity loss. And there are political consequences to that. that uh, so if the generational handover that we describe in, in the first demographic trend occurs, um, the, the way in which that plays out could be quite profound, but it's not certain how it will play out. And there are plausible scenarios, which include uh, millennials and Gen Z failing to register as a political force, um, or that they fall in line and just accept uh, the, the world as it's currently going. You know, we can overgeneralize or be too Western in our view of this. There are places in the world where they're they're quite happy or they're not allowed to be unhappy. Um, there, someone on the call this morning raised the, the chance that millennials would simply be skipped in terms of political power. Uh, and that could give rise to uh, a, a Gen Z that's mobilized in order to avoid being left behind in the same way that millennials are. Uh, and a number of other scenarios which include uh, millennials and Gen Z becoming the electoral bedrock of effective progressive governments, which prior, prioritize issues like economic reform and addressing climate change. So clearly, from uh, our perspective, in service of Vision 2050, that third scenario is the one that's most favorable. So the question is, is how do businesses and governments uh, demonstrate a credible reformist alternative uh, for those types of voters to get on, on board with? We've done similar thinking around automation jobs and economy and also around nationalism and globalism. So you get a picture of the kinds of thinking we've been doing uh, for the macro trends. So Filippo, if you go on to uh, the next slide, I'll now move on to uh, the disruptions. Um, the, the first few months of 2020 have 
powerfully demonstrated that, that these wildcard disruptions do happen and that they can have profound consequences. When we first did this work in late 2019, the term wildcard seemed appropriate for events such as global pandemic or financial crisis, not so much anymore. I've used a, an image of a volcano here because to me it's quite a nice visual metaphor for disruptions. We know the volcano is there. We even have some tools by which to measure its activity and predict when it might explode, but they're not perfect and a lot depends on which way the wind blows. Anne, who will speak later from Nova Nordis, commented on this this morning that, that none of these macro trends or disruptions really are surprising and, and that really is okay. The important thing isn't to know that the volcano might erupt, it's to have a plan for if it does. So if you move to the next slide, Filippo, here you see the, the 10 disruptions that we've identified. The decade ahead will doubtlessly have more wildcards in store. Not everything on the list will come to pass during the 2020s, but all are plausible enough that they weren't thinking about and to the extent possible preparing for as well. They're not all bad, and even those that appear to be that bad have the, the potential to capitalize positive changes, just as previous crises have. Just this morning, David Hone from Shell was reflecting on what someone in 1919 would have thought with the destruction of World War I still raw in their memories and the new destructive power of the 1918 flu, not Spanish at all it turns out, becoming clear all over the world. Would they have predicted the Roaring Twenties? Would they have predicted how technologies released or ideas formed would influence the world a hundred years later? Probably not. We must not waste a good crisis, as the saying goes. And interestingly, the origins of that saying are medical. The full quote is, don't waste a crisis, your patients or your own. So there's something profound in, in that for all of us to ponder on a bit further in the coming weeks. As with the macro trends, there are potential interlinkages between these disruptions. Domino effects where one disruption triggers others are one possibility. For example, we're currently living through a global pandemic that may yet trigger a financial crisis or even a major conflict or popular uprisings that lead to regime change, etc. etc. Similarly, technological, financial and political dimensions of, for instance, the energy transition are all uh, likely to interact with one another in ways that create reinforcing feedback loops. Nonetheless, we've separated out 10, uh, crisis, uh, 10 wild cards uh, that we think are worth spending some more time thinking about. And I'll go through those in uh, as much time as Filippo will give me now, because I'm going to overrun, I can tell, tell you that already. <laughs> Don't rush, and uh, we'll take our time, and then we'll have members' reactions to it. Okay. And uh, by the way, I wanted to remind people on the call, to, uh, Julian, you can catch your breath a bit, uh, that uh, please use the, the, I was going to say the cash function, no, the chat function, excuse me, uh, to uh, raise any questions or comments for uh, the speakers, and we'll try to channel them through uh, by moderating uh, from my end. So, uh, Julian, why don't you walk us through a little bit more detail around these uh, wildcards? Thanks. So, if you go to the next slide, Filippo. So, the first wildcard we've got is financial crisis. The combined effect of countries going into lockdown to slow the spread of COVID-19 and the oil price war that we saw kicked off uh, last month has precipitated one of the fastest and deepest market crashes in history, although some of the worst losses have been reversed for now. Unlike in 2007 and 8, when monetary policy such as quantitative easing and interest rate cuts mostly took the strain of reviving the global economy, governments have already had to roll out unprecedented fiscal measures in response to the coronavirus-induced crash, and there will be certainly more stimulus to come. A lot is riding on how targeted government bailouts and stimulus packages are, including how resilient the economy is when the next crisis or crash comes, as it inevitably will. The approach to stimulus will differ country by country, but in our globalised system, weaker recoveries will also act as a drag on stronger ones. So all these things to consider in the coming months and years. Next slide, Filippo. Global pandemic. COVID-19 is likely to continue causing loss of life and disruption to societies and economies for months, if not years to come. And it didn't come out of nowhere. The past 
20 years have seen five potential pandemics, SARS, H1N1, Zika, Ebola, and MERS, all of which were only one genetic mutation away from being as serious as COVID-19. We may yet see further pandemics in the decade ahead, with the same potential to overwhelm healthcare systems, disrupt supply chains, and shut down economies and societies for a period of time. Clearly, there are lessons to be learned that can improve resilience in the face of the next pandemic. Whether or not governments and businesses heed those lessons remains to be seen. It's also worth mentioning here that the cost of disease is one of perspective. The global economy has largely been put on pause for COVID-19, but there are many illnesses that are far more deadly. TB, AIDS, pneumonia, malaria, cholera. Together, these things kill millions of people every single year. Next slide, Filippo. Major conflict. The possibility of a serious conflict between two or more nations with powerful militaries and deep pockets cannot be ruled out. Were such a conflict to break out, it's likely that cyber attacks on critical, inf critical infrastructure would feature heavily in the tactics of the warring nations. Indeed, arguably, there are already multiple cyber wars raging around the world. In an age of growing cyber dependency, this could cause very significant harm and loss of life amongst ordinary citizens. So too could the deployment of nuclear or biological or chemical we weapons. As happened in the Second World War, such conflict would likely trigger a full mobilization of society and the economy in service of natural war aims in those countries involved, and would produce a spirit of social solidarity within and between nations not seen since the 1940s. There's also a very real chance of more minor conflicts uh, 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 around serious sustainability challenges, such as water, for instance, with two of the um, most important river deltas in the war already leading to serious tensions all down their, their paths. Next slide, Filippo. Economic singularity. Estimates about the impact of automation and artificial intelligence on the number of jobs in the global economy vary incredibly widely. So it's best to, best to take any forecast which a relatively large pinch of salt. But what if those forecasts sing an imminent collapse in the total number of jobs, uh, which is sometimes referred to as an economic singularity, are right? Even if in the long run technology creates as many new jobs as it destroys, the risks of some regions and sectors suffering a prolonged period of severe unemployment is incredibly high. Were this to happen, governments would likely to str struggle to cope with the fallout and the impact of, on those affected by job losses. And that would fan the flames of radical politics further. Next slide, Filippo. Tech lash. In the two decades since the dot-com bubble burst, the tech sector has had an easy ride, relatively. Society has embraced new technologies with minimal hesitation, and regulators have thrown relatively few roadblocks in the way of tech companies doing what they want. That may now be changing, although COVID-19 has distracted people from many societal challenges, very much including the underlying challenges that exist in society's use digital technologies and the services that they make possible. However, we think rising disillusionment and dissatisfaction will return in many countries with the way digital technologies are being used to serve the interests of the narrow economic and or political elite. Consumers are more aware of the negative impacts of technology on health and well-being, and concerns about privacy and data ownership are on the rise, although governments are not always as concerned about privacy as their citizens are. Competition enforcement has become an increasingly hot topic in both the EU and now slowly in the US as well. New rules are about the legal status of gig economy workers and the responsibilities of social media companies for the content they host could undermine the viability of their platform business models. And again, this is an area that might receive some more attention as a result of the vulnerabilities exposed by COVID-19. And then there's the impact of geopolitical rivalry. The Fuhrer over Huawei could be a foretaste of things to come with governments blacklisting foreign firms and allies strained as a result, sorry, alliances strained as a result of having to pick sides. Next slide, Felipe. Popular revolts leading to regime change. Rising inequality within countries and a perceived lack of responsiveness from political elites is fueling a diverse set of mostly nonviolent protests movements around the world. Save a determined push to manage COVID-19 rescue packages in service of addressing the widespread dissatisfaction with globalism and linked inequality, the underlying causes of these popular unrisings look set to remain or indeed worsen during the 2020s. 
It's therefore highly likely that both the frequency and severity of protests against the status quo will rise. The vital unknown is how effective they will be. The 2010s saw a dramatic decline in the success rate of nonviolent campaigns demanding systemic political change, even as their number increased. But there's no guarantee that this trend will continue. As citizens become angrier, and more disaffected, we could see seemingly stable political regimes the world, uh, across the world either toppled or forced to act much more strongly in response to citizens' demands. And let's not forget the power of the vote. Arguably, the UK's Brexit vote and even the election of Donald Trump and other events of recent years could be seen as popular revolts leading to regime change. Next slide, Filippo. A climate Minsky moment. And yes, this is a bit wonky, but I, we like it. A Minsky moment is a sudden downward revision of asset valuations. Over the course of the 2020s, there is, we hope, little doubt that the financial markets will have to get better at pricing both transition and physical climate risks into their asset valuations. There are other environmental, social and government issues that are increasingly on their radar, but climate is the issue most likely to lead to a rapid and dramatic repricing of assets in the near future. There's a good chance that climate related financial disclosures will become mandatory at some stage in the first half of the decade. Technologies that enable greater transparency into asset level data are also developing fast. As the quality of information available improves and the potential losses to investors become both larger and more imminent, a major and potentially sudden reorientation of financial flows becomes increasingly likely. So that is what could trigger a so-called climate Minsky moment, a sudden downward revision of the asset valuations in carbon intensive sectors. Next slide, Filippo. The energy transition reaches a tipping point. Energy transition watchers, watchers are divided into two camps, those that expect gradual change and those that predict a more, much more rapid technology and or policy driven disruption over the coming decade. If the latter group is right, then we can expect to see demand for fossil fuels peak and begin to fall during the 2020s, which would have profound implications for the energy industry, investors, and of course, climate change. The speed and scale for the energy industry investors, sorry, the speed and scale of the cost reductions uh, in the renewable energy sector over the last decade have consistently exceeded expectations and renewables are now at or close to cost competitiveness with fossil fuels in many parts of the world. Depending on how quickly those cost reductions curves bottom out, an economic tipping point may be closer than most analysts think. This doesn't mean that the switch will happen overnight. Uh, it will take time to build out capacity and infrastructure and governments and businesses will need to continue to invest in fossil fuel capacity to delay, to delay. But nonetheless, that tipping point may be closer than we think. Next slide, Filippo. Biotech boom. Synthetic biology has significant potential to transform food production, medicine and materials manufacturing. In some of these areas, we may see non-linear progress during the 2020s as costs decline exponentially. For example, one recent report on the food industry predicted that beef produced in a lab using a process called precision fermentation will become cost competitive with traditional beef from cows in the early 2020s and could be as much as five times cheaper by 2030. The implications could be profound for the agricultural industry as well as for human health and of course the environment. Vast tracts of agricultural land could be opened up for other uses. Meanwhile, in the health sector, synthetic biology is being used to develop gene therapies and personalized medicines, while the plastics industry is increasingly investing in bio-based alternatives. Next slide, Filippo. A global green new deal. Just like the 2000s, the 2010s finished with a disappointing set of climate talks. COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009, COP25 in Madrid in 2019. But there's a significant chance that the 2020s will see a breakthrough in global climate policy action. Though whether or not this will happen through the mechanisms of the Paris Agreement or not remains an open question. From the EU's Green Deal to South Korea's announcement of a net zero target, momentum is building in large economies across the world. This is despite unfavorable political shifts in some key countries. For instance, the US, Brazil, Australia, since the Paris Agreement and of course the continued resistance of states such as Russia and Saudi Arabia. While the latter are likely to remain resistant to climate policy action for the foreseeable future, there is every chance that post-Trump, the US will step back 
into a leadership role on global climate action during the 2020s. Across the globe, citizen activism is likely to be a key driver of political action and the steady drumbeat of extreme weather events will keep climate change high in public consciousness and on the political agenda for most governments. So if you go to the next slide, Filippo, that concludes my run through, rapid run through of the, the, the macro trends and slightly less rapid run through of the, the disruptions that we've been exploring. Uh, just before I hand back to, to Filippo and we hear from our speakers, I wanted to share the Stephen Pinker quote that Filippo actually found uh, late last year, he said, the 2020s will be filled with problems, crises and discord, just like decades before and after. And problems are inevitable, but problems are solvable. The solutions create new problems that can be solved in their turn. For me, this goes to the heart of why it was so important that we do this forward-looking work as part of the Vision 2050 Refresh Project. Problems are inevitable, but their nature and ours is for them to be solved. Understanding what the problems are that need to be solved is the first step to developing solutions and not just creating new problems to be solved, but also to driving progress and opportunity in progress too. Uh, so with that, I conclude uh, my piece and I very much look forward to hearing from Duncan, Anne and Cho on their reactions to this work and of course to the world as it changes rapidly around us. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, for those uh, perspectives and insights. And uh, as Julian mentioned, of course, uh, this is a, a presentation and an overview, a high-level overview, a lot of text and a lot more depth, including, of course, the source thereof is available and will be available in the coming days as we issue uh, this particular piece around 2020, 2030 trends and disruptions. So uh, watch this space. Of course, we'll share that information publicly and, of course, also with all of you. Uh, who are on the call uh, today, both uh, this morning and this afternoon, uh, Geneva time. So uh, allow me then to build uh, on these uh, remarks by Julian and, and the insights to kindly ask our members, representatives from Nestlé, Novodordisk and Shell uh, to provide us with their thoughts around the implications of some of these trends and, and disruptions and, and how they are approaching some of these uh, issues from their vantage point. So uh, I will kick off sort of left to right to keep things simple with uh, Duncan Pollard, who was already uh, this morning with us. Duncan, uh, Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement in Sustainability uh, at uh, Nestlé. Uh, Duncan, I would like to hand uh, the word over to you. I saw you were on the screen, um, so I hope everything works technically and I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Filippo. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Over to you. Good. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to give some comments to this work, uh, Filippo and, and Julian, and uh, congratulations so far on what you've managed to achieve on these, these macro trends. I think there's no doubt that, uh, that COVID has made us far more aware of this uh, and has uh, made us pay more attention to, to this particular work. As you said, uh, Julian, COVID is the rhino in the room um, and is forming our current framing of, of looking at business but I believe that we should not overemphasize uh, its importance. Um, we, if we're honest or if I'm honest I, I'm not sure that as sustainability professionals we, we haven't learned anything we didn't already know when it comes to sustainability and, and the work that we've got to do uh, because of, uh, of COVID. The content that we have is still the same, the external context also uh, is the same, at least in terms of, of these macro trends. Al although, of course, the emphasis is different. Um, there's no doubt, um, well, I get, into the, I get into the range of uh, predictions here, which is also always difficult, but there's no doubt in my mind that, that social capital will have a higher uh, importance in the future. I think, you know, when we look at some of these macro trends, we have to, we have to ask the question, will cities actually be quite so attractive in, in the future, given what we, we're going through at the moment. And, and I think, you know, we might also ask, will individual human rights continue to be important as uh, the rights of society? Um, so there are things that, that we have to reflect on, but, but, but nevertheless, I, as I said, I, I, we, we, we pretty much, from my point of view, still have a job to do. And, and at Nestle, that 
our focus on sustainability is still around climate, plastics, it's around biodiversity, livelihoods and food systems. Um, now certainly we will be giving more emphasis as a, as a consequence of this on livelihoods and food systems, but my sense is that COVID is just likely to make it easier for us professionals to embed the ideas that um, we already have uh, into, into how the business should be operating. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking in terms of uh, how we deal with suppliers because flexibility now is clearly out and resilience is in. And when it comes to the macro trends, then you know, these, these uh, are, are hugely uh, relevant for us as well. Automation, of course, as a, as a, as a company that has over 400 uh, manufacturing uh, sites around the world. Um, Africa and affordable nutrition is, is already super important for us. And, and the reality of climate change. And, you know, I think our current narrative or the, 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 the majority discourse on climate change is how can we get um, onto the one and a half degree or, or below two degree pathway. And, and, and yet we have to face the reality and the facts that there's a 1% chance of getting to one and a half degrees. There's a 50% chance of getting to three and a half degrees. And, and therefore we have to be able to manage uh, to, to both of those, manage the business to both of those uh, potential outcomes. So, um, you know, I, maybe just a few comments um, on, on what I think this means for, for WBCSD. And certainly, I think that um, this work on, on macro trends and, uh, and wildcards has to fit in somehow with, with the work on the capitalism of the future. I, I think that's central. Um, from, Femke Gruthuis of uh, the X-Tax project um, at a recent uh, event, uh, I think summarized it very well. And it's, it's, so it's not really about how much profit the, the companies make, but how that profit is made. Um, and, and I think keeping that in mind, it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice summary of the challenge that we have about the capitalism that we want uh, for the future. So if I look at the key trends and the disruptions, uh, former boss of mine, Jose Lopez, uh, always used to say that if you want to change things, especially in a complex system, you need to change the circumstances. There's no doubt, certainly, that uh, COVID has changed those circumstances. The question for us now is how do we translate this into our day-to-day -day work? How do we build an alignment across WBCSD companies of the many small actions that we can all make um, to take a kind of a collective nudge of the system and the corporate world to accelerate some of these trends uh, that we want to see and some of the outcomes that can be more positive for society. I personally don't have the answer to that, but I, but, um, I, I think that for me, Vision 2050 needs to be able to focus on, on providing some of, the, some of those answers to, to some of those questions. So thank you very much, uh, Filippo. I hand back to you. Thank you so much, Duncan, for the perspectives from uh, sort of with a Nestle hat on and then from a collective uh, action uh, point of view. And certainly interesting quote also by uh, Femke Krothaus around the profit and the way in which it's uh, being made. So thank you very much, uh, Duncan. I want to remind everybody the chat function is on your screen or should be on your screen, depending on whatever device you have. And please don't hesitate to use it to ask any question or clarification to uh, our speakers at any point, so we are monitoring it and it's open for you. Thanks, Duncan. Then from Duncan, uh, left to right, then uh, Anne Gadegaard joining us from uh, Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, representing Novo Nordisk as Associate Director and Senior Advisor in the area of global prevention and health promotion. Uh, Anne, you're also with us this morning. Uh, we've, we've put more emphasis on the trends this afternoon, Julian. Uh, emphasized in particular the disruptions. What are your thoughts uh, that you would like to share with the group today? Yeah, I think uh, I will add to some of the reflections from this morning's, which were very much around the the the, the element of uh, securing the uh, thinking around adaptation, as Julian was uh, referencing. Uh, also, that as Duncan just said, the trends not a big surprise. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this would very much be how businesses and sectors are then approaching uh, the solutions uh, needed. Um, in terms of the disruptions, one of the um, components of what Julian was presenting, the inequality, we definitely think will have a much bigger impact uh, to how 
uh, not just businesses are acting, but also how governments will be making business, uh, will be making decisions uh, going forward. This will not necessarily be by just uh, uh, revolutions, by individuals gathering together, fighting against inequality, but inequalities will be hi not highlighted, but will be evident uh, post COVID-19. And we do think that the, that particular element will have a significant bigger, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, role to play uh, going forward, whether it will lead to uh it being societal's right ra not rather than that's not what duncan was saying but 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 it will be a prioritization question be between what the what society needs and the individual i think that's an interesting thought uh, and i'll definitely bring that one back to for a conversation in 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 our organization as another element um we which is not surprisingly being a healthcare company is that we do think health will play a bigger role, not just to the degree of discussing health as part of securing a resilient healthcare system in a given country, but also in terms of how do we organize ourselves to secure a resilient health going forward. One interesting fact that had at least um, surfaced in, 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 in Denmark this past week is that uh, if you look into the statistics of uh, unfortunate people dying from COVID-19, there is a high percentage of pe overweight people uh, in, in that population. And I do think that part will potentially, at least we think that that will potentially also inform maybe some of the solutions that we will be looking into going forward, partnering on how do you secure a healthy population in terms of not just the health and the products, uh, being pharmaceutical products, but also in terms of how we organize ourselves, how we're dealing with climate change, and 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 finally how the whole food uh, element, so not just the sustainability of value chains, agricultural value chains, but also what is the nutritional value, and this is where I do think uh, the whole reflection from Duncan on the balance between the individual right and societal uh, uh, right, it might see some changes because there will be a societal reflection on what is the health or the what is the health level would need from a societal point of view compared to what is the uh, uh, decision power of the individual so what do you want to nudge a society and what do you not want to nudge so in terms of the whole disruptions we do and and the action element that also duncan's was uh, was was asking for 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 this piece of work one of the things that we will be looking into is to how we better engage the whole food climate and health nexus in terms of uh, making that sort of uh, conversations uh, happen going forward so this is what i wanted to add uh, in in in, in uh, what i wanted to add in addition to the reflection shared uh, this morning so thank you very much filippo and thank you uh, julian for again an amazing presentation Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for those uh, thoughts around, you know, the linkages to resilience, health to resilience, but also the linkage to food, uh, climate, nutrition, certainly interesting avenues mm -hmm. continue to deepen, uh, including, as uh, Duncan alluded to, of course, to targeted collective uh, action. So certainly something to, mm -hmm. to continue to deepen on the back of the Vision 2050 work and on the back, of course, of, of many projects ongoing across the Council, but also in many other organizations. Um, we will head now from uh, Novodortis to Shell. We have uh, Dr. Cho Ong Kong, Chief Political Analyst, uh, popping up on my screen. Uh, fantastic. Um, doctor, uh, over to you, sir, for your reflections uh, from a Shell perspective. We had your colleague David Hall uh, this morning uh, sharing some of his thoughts and looking forward to your uh, perspectives. Over to you. Thank you, Filippo. Can you just check if you can hear me? Yes, ab absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, one of the, uh, actually, one of the disadvantages of coming last is that uh, one sometimes feels that, that, that anything worth saying has already been said. Um, so, I'm struggling to find something that might perhaps be helpful. Um, and uh, I have a few points I'd like to make. Um, firstly, uh, with the initial presentation by Julian, I was really struck by how comprehensive uh, the uh, macro trends and the wild cards were, I mean, there's a lot of material there. 
Um, and um, there are a few uh, areas where I think I would nudge the, uh, the, the, the points made in one direction or another, but I think uh, all of us can be in broad agreement uh, with uh, what uh, with uh, with uh, Julian's uh, 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 slides. Um, what I would suggest is the following, though. Uh, given this 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 great mass of material, I think it would help considerably, at least for me, uh, to try to, uh, in a way, prioritize that uh, that list and to try to just get a sense of how do we. How, what, what is the frame through which we view all this material? So, um, uh, 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 and ultimately, of course, uh, we are aiming at actions which can be put into place, which, uh, 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 which are possible to take. Uh, in scenarios, we always have two key tests of the success of any scenario effort. One is, did you get it right? Not in the sense of did you predict the future because no one can, uh, but did the different outcomes that you've set out encompass what actually ensued? Uh, and we're pretty good at that, I have to say. I mean, if I look back on our track record, we've pointed to many things uh, that subsequently happened. The second test, however, which is the more difficult one, is uh, what did key decision makers do as a consequence of your getting it right? And that's a much higher target to aim for. We sometimes got it right, we sometimes haven't. So I think the test of this particular exercise would be what do companies do differently from what they might otherwise have done before. That's a test we apply, uh, we apply internally, and that's a test I suggest that we bear in mind when we think about uh, the work that we're doing uh, uh, on this project. So that's the first point. Um, when I look at uh, the different points that have been made, uh, so for instance, Julian raised the issue of polarization and radicalism on the rise, and I think we all see that. But I ask myself, with the impact of COVID-19, is this beginning to change? Uh, we see that the great mass of people everywhere uh, is paying greater attention to experts, uh, to people who know what they're talking about. And of course, don't forget, that with populism, people are always saying, don't trust the experts, and they were being encouraged to that view. So all sorts of far right uh, or far left views were being promulgated, often without any uh, uh, connection with facts. Uh, and now I think uh, increasingly, people are turning to the experts, they're turning to their own governments. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, because it's, it's very much seeking uh, a way forward out of the problems that they're facing. If we think about populism, and if we think about uh, political leaders who've been elected on populist platforms, some of them, I, uh, uh, I would say, are having uh, second thoughts about what they've said in the past, and they are changing their views as they're maturing, in other words. Um, others, uh, and I don't want to mention names, but you can see around you in different parts of the world, others are actually having their populist views challenged. Uh, by, uh, uh, by, uh, by actually the great mass of people who are saying, well, I, actually, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not, I, I, don't believe, I don't believe I can accept what you, I, I can't accept what you say. So uh, there's that aspect as well. I think uh, with Duncan, uh, uh, again, you know, he mentioned urbanization, and this is possibly going to change uh, as a consequence of uh, uh, COVID-19. And then, of course, a very important point, which is also uh, 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 echoed by Anne, which is individual versus collective rights. And that's a hugely important question. Uh, and is the balance between individual and collective rights going to change as a consequence of this uh, pandemic that has hit all of us? And something that we did, actually we started this work uh, more than a year ago, and we did it in connection with looking at energy transition and dealing with climate. Something that we did a year ago was the issue of, uh, of, of common good. We looked at what does common good mean in different societies, in societies where um, uh, you get much more emphasis on collective rights, as well as in societies where the individual has played a much more prominent role. So there are differences, uh, but there's always this issue at the back of every society of what binds it together, what's the common good in that society that it's trying to achieve. 
Um, the next thing I would point out is, uh, yeah, 2020 to 2030 is the critical decade because it sets the base for the decades ahead. When we think about energy transition, climate change, it's going to hit us, but what we do in the coming decade will be critical. And we are well aware uh, of the fact that uh, actions uh, for future crises uh, to deal with them will have to be taken now. Uh, one of the, I know you said you, you looked very comprehensively, you decided not to do scenarios, but one of the positive things we believe uh, in doing scenarios is that it gives us a range of different possible outcomes that our key decision makers can uh, grapple with. So if we think about COVID-19, yes, it's a destabilizer, uh, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, and we look at, if we look at pandemics in human history, uh, they've been used as a justification to put up the barriers. That's true. We can pick, up, pick out examples from the past. But they've also been used as an opportunity to build a better and fairer world. And we do have discussions around that taking place right now because the existing order, the past order, has been to a large degree upended. So what would we need to put in its place? Now, that future crisis could well be another pandemic coming uh, down the line and will we be better prepared or it could be something like uh, uh, one of your wild cards and of course climate is very much at the forefront of our minds uh, and what the crisis has done has been to expose many failings in our accepted framework of the global economy how we should run a, a, a glo the global economy how we should uh, uh, run politics but what the crisis has also done have been to underline the underlying strengths that we've had before. If you look at least some of the countries that have been coping with this challenge, uh, and think of the more effective ones, countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, which stand out, what are the qualities that have enabled them to deal more effectively with the crisis? And we find, uh, and I don't want to say that other countries haven't as well. I mean, I think everyone is, I think, struggling to rise to the challenge. Uh, and I think we're all learning from the best examples. The, the, the last point, uh, the, the second last point I'd like to make is about interdependencies. And I think uh, that, that came up uh, uh, with uh, Anne's statement about looking at the, the food water nexus and so on. And I think looking at interdependencies in our different trends will be very important because they play off each other. Uh, and so in energy terms, we've been very concerned about food and about access to water because that impacts directly on uh, 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 energy extraction and energy use. And the last point I'm going to make is that I, I'd like to come back here to action that we can take as businesses. So what are the implications for business? And I think that's a very important uh, 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 section to draw out in, uh, in terms of, you know, how you're looking at this project. So, for instance, uh, uh, for us, certainly, when we uh, uh, look at... Uh, the, uh, what's, what's happening right now around us, uh, how we use energy is critical going forward, so travel is hugely important, and so on. These are the obvious things. Uh, but there's lots, I think, that uh, your varied membership will be concerned about. Uh, we do know uh, that I think the crisis hits small businesses and, indiv and many individuals very hard, and so what does it mean for them? What's the impact on them, and how do we actually overcome uh, as a common society, how we overcome uh, these difficulties. And of course, there's the whole uh, question that's coming to the surface now uh, of how we pay for all of this debt. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, rather than try to squeeze things even further, how do we turn this round so that it can be a positive force to build for a better future? So thank you so much, Filippo. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. Uh, very much appreciate those thoughts uh, and your points about interdependencies. <laughs> ultimately, also your point, how do we ultimately pay for all of this uh, in terms of transformation of uh, major economic systems? Uh, who's going to pay for what? And uh, how are some of these scenarios going to play out uh, in uh, discussion and in, 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 uh, in, uh, in engagement with policymakers, among other things, from a business uh, perspective side? Um, there are a few questions in the chat uh, function and uh, I would like to pick one that can probably be applied to all of you, but I'll probably apply it to uh, Anne uh, Gadegaard first and then uh, Duncan. It's the question around uh, business schools and the role of education. At the end of the day, it's also 
Of course, recruitment uh, within uh, companies the size of yours uh, is of course drawing a lot in uh, recruits from uh, business schools. And how can we make, as the question comes here from uh, Dr. Uh, Diva Singhal from Goa in India, how can we make future managers aware of the choices they make and the sustainability consequences of those decisions? How can we inform uh, this sort of um, curricula? How could you uh, influence it? Do you have any thoughts around this in particular, around the business school angle and the sustainability imperatives that are coming more and more to the fore? Uh, let's start with Anne. Well, uh, thank you, Julian, and thank you, Dr. Singhal, for the question. A, having uh, been around forever, I have to say, so I will definitely be in the uh, generation, <laughs> not a baby boomer though, but, but still, um, I think seeing the outcome coming from a business school myself, seeing the outcome of the transition business schools, at least in, in, in the Nordic, have been through from where it was actually odd that we were looking into the wider social contract uh, of a business to society when I was there into having now masters, MBAs, uh, a, a specific institute working on ela, ela, guiding uh, students on sustainability in business. Mm -hmm. Know that the struggle has been the integration into other uh, business, um, uh, what do we say, curriculum. Uh, so it means, yeah. yeah. So it means that the uh, that the uh, uh, new, uh, not new, but the younger employees that we get fresh out of business schools, some of them are all engaged on sustainability because this has been their topic, but they wouldn't necessarily have the same level of business integration understanding that would be needed. And then the ones working in specific functions where that sort of sustainability reflection you would actually appreciate was there, don't necessarily have that as part of their curriculum. I know the Copenhagen Business School have, have not completely succeeded, but at least they do have some cases on how this has been possible. And I think this leads then into the third question down from this one. How do you actually engage employees um, and, 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 and board members, etc.? Yeah. And I think it's, it's such a difficult task. And, and I think it comes a little bit back to the baby boomers and generation X, millennials set, whatever, that we have a gap due to what context have you been exposed to either as your education or who you hang out with in terms of your peers so if you among your peers don't hear this conversation around what sustainability will mean to your business the resilience of your business going forward then it's a very tough uh, um, conversation to have but we do start to see this context at least not just from an ed educational point of view but also from who are engaging within investors on saying we need resilience we need long-term thinking and we are getting uh, different types of signals that we traditional have at least in Novo Nordisk from uh, the types of uh, business graduates or past post business graduates who have now moved to a level in the organization where you wouldn't necessarily expect that they had been exposed to this. So I think this question very much links into how do you also engage? And this is about then nudging. How do they get exposed to this context, either as, either as students or as matured business professionals uh, in the organizations? So that was my five cents, Jude, uh, Filippo. Thank you for the five cents. Uh, Duncan, do you want to add your five cents to this? Uh, but it is answered by Anne around the engagement in particular on business schools, the education system. Yeah, maybe maybe two reflections. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I think that uh, business schools will always struggle um, to fully embed or embrace sustainability for two reasons. I, I think the faculty system that, that many of them have is, as Anne suggested, not set up for for sustainability um well if, if we teach in sustainability as a separate subject alongside finance or alongside you know whatever um then supply chains then then we got we we're going to fail and people are never going to really uh, understand uh, it and, and, and embed it in the way it should be and whilst ever we have the the uh, the ranking of of business schools uh, 
as is at the moment, uh, with its heavy emphasis upon uh, the, 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 the before and after salaries of, uh, of people that go through these business schools, yeah. then you start to see the unintended consequences because they will never prepare people to go into the rich range of organizations that, um, that, that society needs. Uh, they will always be the elite ones providing the education for the management consultancies and, and so on and so forth, um, who quite frankly are not the place where sustainability needs to be uh, embedded. So, so I think, I think we, the, the easy thing that we could do with business schools is to change the ranking system um, and, uh, and find a way which uh, aligns better with the needs of society. And I, I think maybe if I, if I may, whilst I've got the floor, I just respond um, partially at least to the, the next question down from yeah. Oriol Fabregas. Uh, and, and my answer is an easy one there because I think that's really the, the topic um, that we've uh, got inside the, uh, the Vision 20 uh, refresh work and that's, and that's what is the capitalism of the future. Um, and, and I think it's probably the, the best answer that could be given to that question is, is uh, for everyone to read the book Prosperity by Colin Mayer of, uh, of Oxford University, um, who sets out the history of, of why companies were formed and really what companies are about. And uh, companies are not about, they're not there to make money. So, um, we 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 need we need to kind of um, reimagine and, uh, and and repurpose um, the role of companies and, and the type of capitalism that we after in order to be able to to answer that question because the sad fact is that uh, it is a trade off actually economic impact uh, versus uh, environmental and social impact. Thank you, Duncan, uh, for those perspectives. Um, I'm going to jump to uh, Dr. Cho Hong Kong uh, with a question from Gabriel uh, Voto. I don't know if you can see it uh, in the chat, but it's uh, basically the question from Gabriel Voto is building on the work of uh, Adam Kahan, uh, former Shell Adaptive Scenario Planning Director. What do you think is the responsibility of business, uh, not only to analyze uh, passively, as uh, Gabriel Voto says, the potential scenarios, macro trends, Etc., but to support a transformative scenario planning exercise and to be more active actors on the development of new and better future scenarios. Would you like to comment? I think you are on mute. And if you are not, you have to unmute yourself. There How's it go. going? Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So just uh, a couple of points, if I may. Um, one is, well, Adam Kahane, I have to say, uh, full disclosure is a good friend. Um, uh, and what I would say about scenarios is that they hold up a mirror uh, as to what could possibly happen. Uh, but uh, I think if you, it comes back to the two tests that I set out earlier. If you hold up that mirror and you say, well, I'm not going to do anything about it now, then I think the exercise has failed. Uh, but you need to hold up that mirror in order for the key decision makers themselves uh, to be passionate and to be active about doing something about that future. So uh, 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 the, 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 the scenario planning exercise needs to be transformative about, uh, uh, about where the organization you're part of uh, uh, makes for a better future. And, and since I'm here online now, could I just respond a little bit to Duncan? I do, I do agree very much uh, with uh, what he said about business school, but uh, Colin Meyer is certainly another uh, uh, a friend of ours. Uh, and I do believe he comes from the side business school in Oxford. So uh, I think business schools themselves are actually questioning their purpose these days and beginning to change. Uh, that change may be slow in coming, but uh, you, you can feel the winds of change are beginning to blow. Okay, I'm done, Filippo. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much also for jumping on the opportunity to comment on, on each other's uh, perspectives. 
Uh, Julian, uh, we're slowly wrapping up, but I, I wanted to give you also the chance to reflect on, on how some of these questions and comments reflect on the wider ambition of WBCSD around um, refreshing this vision 2050. If you could maybe give us two minutes of closing thoughts and then I'll wrap up with a, a few sort of household um, housekeeping items again. Julian, over to you. Thanks, Filippo. Um, so I, I, I think the, the, you know, what we've tried to cover here is um, a view of what the ten, next 10 years might hold for all of us. Uh, as I said, this is, or as Filippo said at the beginning, this is just one part of a, of a much larger project. Duncan has referred to uh, some work we're doing looking at the role of stakeholder capitalism within uh, the Vision 2050 work. Uh, there, there is an awful lot going on within it to try and at the end bring all of these different pieces back together and uh, in effect answer uh, what Dr. Kong was asking for, which is to uh, present this information to decision makers in a way that makes them do something differently. Our, um, our, so our aim with the, with the vision work is to identify the, the key transitions that need to play, take place, the actions that business will need to take within those transitions, uh, the, the way in which the trends and potential disruptions of the 10 years that will follow may affect the, uh, the business's ability to take those actions, um, and then what the levers are that business has available to it to, um, uh, to unlock change at a rate and scale that is appropriate for the, the challenges that we, that we face. Um, and so whilst I can't give the answer to some of the questions uh, that have been asked in the chat, uh, nor uh, immediately provide Dr. Kong with a prioritized list of which uh, trends and disruptions are most important for business to take into account. But what I can say is that our aim here is to get to a point where we have a prioritized list uh, of actions for business to take, where we understand what the, uh, the impacts, uh, the, the, the way in which the world is unfolding uh, will be that will, that will either help or hinder businesses' ability to take those actions, and where we have correctly considered uh, as comprehensively as possible what role business needs to be playing in, uh, in a society that allows these transformations to happen, uh, the way in which it is making its profit um, in, in the years to come is also uh, sitting underneath all of that as a foundation to the recommendations that we make. So that's the, the aim of the, of the vision project in total. This is just one aspect of it, uh, but that is being um, given far more prominence than it would have been uh, even a month ago as a result of everyone now actually being interested in, in what unexpected things or per, 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 it, perceived to be unexpected things could happen uh, down the line. Thanks, Felipe. Thanks, Julian, and thank you to all our speakers for, for their perspectives and for their uh, generous time and, and, and insights, of course. Uh, we are almost at the uh, half past the hour, so it's my duty also to keep this thing on track and basically uh, wrap up with a few housekeeping items. Housekeeping items in the form of letting you know that uh, we will have uh, the recordings and the slides of today's sessions. Uh, I say sessions because we had, as I said, uh, one earlier in the day, uh, Geneva time and now one in the afternoon. They will all be made available to you by direct uh, mail. So uh, watch your inbox for uh, that piece of information alongside a few key takeaways that we will compile over the next few hours. Uh, watch this space also for uh, a so-called issue brief. So this short condensation of research uh, being available to all of you being publicly available around this 2020-2030 operating uh, landscape. That will be uh, next week. Uh, we are working on a few tweaks, uh, but it will be made public, uh, av uh, publicly available uh, next week. And uh, to uh, jump on Julian's uh, point above, uh, just beforehand a few minutes ago about Vision 2050, for those who are not yet familiar with it, uh, you are more than welcome to visit the link uh, that we give you here to find out more and to find additional pieces of insights 
that we are developing alongside the plan, the overall plan, so that you know where we are coming from also with the perspectives that we shared uh, today. Um, I also want to call attention to the session, the next featured session that takes place within this event series, which focuses, uh, which really zooms in uh, on this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, on this significant uh, impacts, the significant impacts it is having and what it means for the decade ahead. Uh, happy to report that a number of members alongside Julian and uh, Volans have uh, taken a deeper look at it. There's a thought piece, an issue brief that is being developed and we will be sharing the highlights, the key takeaways in a, in a, in the, in a similar virtual uh, meeting context next Wednesday. Again, in the similar format at 10 a.m. CET or at 4 p.m. CET, depending on your uh, agenda and availabilities, of course, and, and we appreciate any uh, participation from your end live, but of course also watch the space uh, to register, but also watch the space on the events website of WBCSD if you want to access the recording and or the slides uh, later uh, on. So with that said, a big thank you, a big thank you to uh, all of you for <clears throat> attending uh, today. Uh, uh, an enormous thank again to our member representatives of Shell, of Novo Nordisk and uh, of Nestlé. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, of course, also to all of our members and experts who have contributed uh, to the insights that were presented today and that they are continuing to shape uh, this refresh of uh, Vision 2050 alongside the wider uh, WBCSD uh, membership. And thank you also, of course, to my colleague uh, Julian, who is a crosstown in Geneva, uh, and alongside the, both the London and Geneva-based teams of Vision 2050 who are on the line. Thank you to all of them for the continued energy and drive into this uh, process that will last all the way throughout 2020. We look forward to the final uh, outputs that are uh, shaping this uh, thinking uh, and uh, of course to the collective action that will follow uh, on the back already of all of the things being done uh, nowadays. So thank you again with, uh, with a short message of, you know, of course, wishing you uh, good health and safety. It's probably not only, not probably, but certainly the number one priority in this um, crisis at times. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with any question, comment or, or concern. And I want to say I'm aware that there has been a little bit of a technical issue for a number of you, I think 15 or 20 of you, with the access uh, codes, with the mailing. We apologize for that. I apologize on behalf of the team. Uh, we are also all working remotely and figuring out the technical details uh, remotely and it creates transactional costs. So I apologize for that and, and please rest assured all of the recordings and materials are available online. And if there's any issue, please reach out to our team, the events team at wbcsd.org. So with that said, at, at 5.30 p.m. Geneva time, I want to thank you all again. Wish you a good continuation of the day or a good night or good evening, uh, wherever you are. And thank you again for being with us and looking forward to uh, being in touch again over the coming days and weeks. Thank you so much and uh, speak again soon. Bye-bye.